Welcome to Legal Learning Thursday. I am Brittany Horton with Coast to Coast Legal Aid, and today I'm here to discuss service animals and emotional support animals in terms of housing. Um, the Fair Housing Act prohibits discrimination based on a disability. So in order for you to get an accommodation, uh, you actually have to request it for one, but two, an accommodation is actually just asking for the housing individual or the housing authority to alter a rule or policy or practice. Um, so that way everybody can enjoy the housing opportunities equally. Um, so that could be anywhere from allowing you to have an emotional support animal with you or your service animal with you or needing to be on the first floor because you can't walk upstairs. Um, so an accommodation is just anything that will help you function and enjoy the housing experience like everybody else. So for this presentation, we're gonna be talking in terms of assistance animals um, and assistance animals are gonna be both service animals and the emotional support animals. Assistance animals are not considered pets. Um, so the service animal is trained to do something specific to help you with your disability. And then the emotional support animal is there to help you with whatever emotional needs you have. Um, so they're not actually considered pets, just like a guinea pig or a cat that you just happen to enjoy having. That's a pet while assistance animals are not considered pets, which is why they fit into some of these um, wonderful categories to help protect them. So some examples of training and work that the individual animal can do is You've seen seeing eye dogs. Um, there are the dogs who help individuals who have post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, keeping people out like a distance or helping them through crowds or kind of like pawing at their face or licking them to make sure that they stay present in the moment and they're not going through a flashback. Um, so many housing units have a no strict pet policy, and that is really true here in South Florida. They, a lot of places also have a weight limit on the type of dog you can have. Well, if you have an assistance animal, the housing place cannot, they cannot enforce the weight limit, nor can they enforce the no pet policy and nor can they enforce the your dog is a specific breed you can't have it policy um so you just can't they can't say oh because you have a pit bull you can't live here when it's an assistance animal they can't say that to you it's a form of discrimination and then you can go into a whole other realm of legalities and things to go with that um, so there is a two-part assessment that the housing provider has to consider is, does the resident asking to live with the animal have a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or, ma one or more major life activities? And then does the resident have a disability-related need for an assistant animal? You have to answer yes for both of these in order for you to fall under the protections of the Fair Housing Act to allow you to have the assistance animal with you. If one of the answers is no, then you will not have the protections of the Fair Housing Act. So 
So the housing provider can ask for your documentation if your disability is not readily apparent. Readily apparent means that you look at someone and you can't tell or you see that they have a disability. Housing authorities and housing providers cannot ask somebody who's blind for documentation because their disability is readily apparent. You look at them and you can tell that they're blind. Somebody who is in a wheelchair, you can't ask for documentation because their disability is readily apparent. However, for somebody who might be deaf, you can ask for documentation because you can't really tell if somebody is deaf by just looking at them. Or anyone who has any sort of mental or emotional disabilities, um, they can ask for documentation regarding those because you can't tell by looking at someone that they have anxiety or depression or post-traumatic stress disorder or bipolar or that they can't regulate their emotions appropriately because of being um, autistic and being on the spectrum. So it's really important to understand when a housing provider can ask for documentation and when they can't. It's if the disability is not readily apparent that they can't ask for the documentation. Okay, now into the documentation. I cannot emphasize this enough. There is no registration. It does not exist. There is no registration system for service animals. There is no registration for emotional support animals. So all those registration sites and everything that you see online, 100% a scam because they do not exist. It is not a thing. So do not fall for it. Do not pay them money to have your animal quote unquote registered because I don't know where they're being registered at, but it doesn't matter and it does nothing for you and you just paid people hundreds of dollars to have your animal registered for no reason whatsoever. Um, now for the type of documentation that they can ask for when the disability is not readily apparent is they can ask for a determination letter from federal, state, or local government agency, such as if you receive SSI or if you receive SSDI, or if you receive um, compensation benefits from the VA, that will be enough to show that you have a disability. If you get a housing voucher and it says on there that you have a disability or you need some sort of accommodation, you can also get a letter or an email or something from your healthcare provider, whether it be a therapist, a psychiatrist, a primary care physician, somebody who treats you on the regular for whatever disability that you're trying to get the animal for, then they can ask for documentation from them. It's usually just like a letter saying that they've been treating you for X number and you need this animal for your treatment. The housing provider cannot cannot require you to give them your diagnosis, how severe your disability is, or any or ask for any medical records. So you are not required to tell them what the disability diagnosis is. You just have to tell them that you do need this accommodation and that it's to help you with your treatment and your daily living. I do want to note that in Florida, they no longer accept those letters that you pay one time and the person will write a letter stating that you need this service animal. Florida does not accept those letters, do not pay for those letters, because while Florida does allow telehealth, those letters are invalid and will not count. So you need to see the telehealth can be for somebody that you see on a regular basis and you can get a letter from them. But the letter from 
whoever social worker is saying that you need an emotional support animal is not going to be enough in Florida anymore just because you purchased it online. So a service animal is a dog or in Florida, miniature horses that is individually trained to do work or perform tasks for the benefit of the individual with the disability. So the task that the dog or miniature horse is trained to do has to be related to your disability specifically. What I mean by that is if you have If you're blind and you can't see, then your dog help or the miniature horse helps you see things and guides you. That is related to your disability. But if you have depression and your dog helps you find your car keys, that's not related to your disability. In Florida, an individual with a disability is entitled to full and equal accommodations in all public accommodations. And this is for service animals only. So in Florida, an individual with a disability has the right to be accompanied by a service animal in all areas of the public accommodation that a public or customers are normally permitted to occupy. So you can bring your service animal with you to the pool if it's needed for your disability. They can't tell you no. They can tell you no that the service animal can't be in the pool necessarily but they can't tell you that you can't bring it to the pool area if it is needed for your disability. It does have to be under your control. So for some individuals who can't be in a crowd or who can't be in confined spaces, their dog will be off leash to just kind of keep a perimeter around them and help them keep people away from them so that the individual doesn't feel claustrophobic or anything. As long as the dog is under control, so they come when you call them and they answer when you talk to them, then that is perfectly fine. Otherwise, it is best to keep the dog on a leash. So the accommodation cannot ask about the nature or extent of the individual or of the disability but they can ask if a service animal is required because of a disability and what work or tasks the animal has been trained to perform. And the housing authority or housing provider cannot impose a deposit or surcharge. So if you're in an apartment complex and they normally have a pet fee, you they can't imply that on you. They can't charge that to you. It's illegal. You are liable for any damages that your animal does, just like anyone else. If the service animal is out of control or not housebroken or the behavior is a threat to others, then the housing provider does have the right to remove the animal because now it is a safety to others. This is just some definitions of housing accommodations, what an individual with a disability, public accommodation. The major life activity means a function such as caring for oneself, performing manual tasks, walking, seeing, hearing, speaking, breathing, learning and walking or and working. Um, that's more of just functioning on a regular basis. Some individuals with disability or with depression are not able to get out of bed. So their service animal 
forces them to get out of bed and function throughout the day. And again, service animals are trained to help people with specific disabilities. It can be trained to help somebody with psychiatric or neurological disabilities by preventing like impulsive behavior or destructive behaviors, or as I mentioned before, somebody who has post-traumatic stress disorder, kind of knocking them back into where they are currently to avoid a flashback or having a panic attack. The consequences of violating the statutes is a second degree misdemeanor. That is anyone who denies a service animal, but also if you pretend that you have a service animal or say that you have a service animal and it is actually not a service animal, then you can also be charged with a second degree misdemeanor. Now, emotional support animals, do not have to be a dog. It does not have to be a miniature horse. So you can have an emotional alligator or emotional peacock if that's what you choose. Um, and they, but they don't have the same protections as service animals. Emotional support animals are separate. Now, if you are requesting to keep more than one emotional support animal, you will have to show why each individual animal is needed. So if you want to have a chicken coop with like four chickens, you're gonna have to show why each chicken is necessary. And it can't be for the same thing. You can't say, I have depression, so I need four chickens. That's not gonna work. The housing provider may require proof of compliance with state and local requirements for licensing and vaccinating. So they can require you to make sure that your animal has the rabies vaccine and that they do get treatment for heartworms and the preventative for any other routine vaccination that may be required. Because there's no registry, ID cards, certificate patches, or any other form of whatever you buy from the internet is not sufficient to prove that you have a disability or a disability-related need for an ESA. So just because you can buy it from the internet does not mean that you are protected under the Fair Housing Act and that you can have your emotional support animal with you. This is just a cute little picture to show the differences between a service animal and a some emotional support animal. Emotional or service animals are specially trained. The service animals can go just about anywhere. Now both animals can be with you where you live. Service animals only train to assist one person. And at the very bottom, again, there is no certification. There is no registry. Please do not fall for that. This is just some updates. Um, as I mentioned, please, please, please do not fall for the registry. There is no such thing. It does not exist. It is a money-making scam. Do not do it. Again, Florida does not accept letters from online providers specializing in providing only assistant animal diagnoses and documentation. Florida does not allow that anymore. So you will have to go get treatment from somebody who specializes in your disability and get some sort of documentation from that individual. And any housing that accepts federal funding must accommodate assistance animals. Thank you for joining me for legal learning. Like and follow us on Facebook and YouTube at Coast to Coast Legal Aid for more updates and trainings.